Welcome everyone, this is Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I will be your mindset coach today. And today we're gonna be talking about discipline. I talk about discipline quite a bit and we are going to continue to talk about the main different things of personal development, motivation, discipline, success, happiness, purpose, all of those and much more of course. When we're looking at discipline, it is almost like the gas for the car. It's like, if you don't have the gas, you ain't going nowhere. So we give ourselves the gas and we make sure the gas is a good quality gas, not watered down, maybe not diesel if we have a regular gas engine, or if we have a diesel engine, we're not putting in regular gas, unleaded gas. Some people think, oh, well, it's okay if I water the gas down today. Maybe the discipline is, I'm not going to go to the gym today. You water it down. Maybe I'm not going to eat a healthy meal. I'm not going to become disciplined in what I do. You water it down. Maybe I'm not going to show up to a family event because I feel tired. You water it down. Discipline is doing the hard things when you don't want to do the hard things. Discipline is doing the things that might hurt, but you understand it's going to bring a pleasure when you're done. The gym, great example. In the beginning, you probably don't want to go to the gym because the pain, because of the sweat, because your heart, your brain is literally saying, hey, fool, you're going to die. The brain's job is to keep you alive. And if you don't train the brain, which you have to train the brain, to think, okay, well, I don't care what you think about comfort. I'm going to surpass it. Eventually, the brain is going to do something very cool. All right, this guy is crazy. This girl is crazy. They're psychotic. Let me give them the energy. Let me give them the focus. Let me give them determination. Let me give them the discipline. The brain does it. The brain gets out of its own way when it realizes that you are going to supersede the feeling of comfort. That is the brain's job, to make you comfortable, to make sure that you are safe in the sense of if you ever have to fight or flight. That is a survival mechanism that has been intertwined in our DNA for as long as we've been around. And we do have to understand that we live in a plush society today. We don't necessarily need to have that fight or flight aspect, that instinct, we should go against it. Maybe there's going to be a time when we should listen to it, but for now, we can be almost forward in how we think about it. The moment you feel fear is the moment you approach it. Let's be, you know, very smart here, critical thinking. Just had a blog on it. Just had a podcast on it. Critical thinking, okay? Have that aspect before you start jumping into snake pits. We want you to understand that there's going to be aspects of safety and then aspects of progression. Because you can be safe and progress, but sometimes it's going to be hard to progress if you're always trying to be safe. So you do have to understand the brain has like an e-brake and is trying to make sure that, hey, don't go too fast. We don't want you to get hurt. Don't go too far. We don't want you to you know run out of energy and then you're stuck. We are worried about everything, but what truly is capable. We have a power within us that we do not know that you do not know. Maybe at one point in your life, you get a taste of it. But I will tell you, I've been coaching past 15 years around there. Yeah, 15 years about. Just 14 going to be 15. And I mean, we don't know what we can do. When I started off, I might have thought, oh, I know the potential. I know the limit but I keep surpassing it. It's almost like if you create a world record, can you beat that world record? Yeah, you already beat it once, but can you beat it again? Can you become more disciplined to challenge yourself and grow stronger? The brain, the body is going to acclimate to what you want, but discipline has to be there. So today I'm going to be bringing on a discipline coach, Justin Peterson. He's going to be helping us understand what is discipline, his story, and how he helps people find it. So let's get into that interview with Justin and myself. Welcome, Justin Peterson, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Today, I have you on as a discipline coach, and we're going to be talking on all levels, all aspects of discipline today. The work that you do cannot be missed. A lot of people are living in the world today without discipline. They think motivation is the answer, but discipline is the true key to success. So we're going to be talking about that all today. But in your own words, can you please tell the world who you are, what you do, and how you help them? Sure. Yeah. 
so I'm a husband, a father of three boys. I say I'm a rebel with the cause. I like to do things differently. I always have. I don't really know where that came from. I own a life insurance agency as my day-to-day. I've been in that for many years now, and I'm a discipline coach. I'm not a personal trainer. I'm not a nutritionist. I don't want to be, but what I found in my own life is that there were so many points through my professional career where I would achieve these loud and really in-your-face, grandiose accomplishments, and then I would rest on my laurels, and my career would kind of go like this. And what I realized in self-reflection was I didn't have that underlying discipline of doing the hard things when I didn't want to. If on a macro level, I was going like this, then the only way to really fix that was on a micro level. And my whole world changed whenever I hired my own coach and he had me wake up early, whether I felt like it or not, moved my body every day, whether I felt like it or not, and tracked my food and got on a disciplined nutritional regimen. And then as a byproduct, my physique completely transformed and then everything changed from there. And so I just help people basically keep the promises that they've made to themselves that they've had a hard time keeping on their own. I hold their feet to their fire. And to be honest with you, man, it fills me up. I love it to death. I mean, I know, you know, in your own experience that helping somebody achieve their goals is just magnificent. So I love what I do. Yeah. When it comes to like the mind and the body, it's like, You can have a very strong mind, but if you don't have the body, the vessel to get there, you're going to just not have the energy. You're going to be more lethargic. So when you become more disciplined and moving, it doesn't even have to be going to the gym. It could be just walking around the block after dinner every evening. That can be enough for you to say, okay, I'm going to begin to take a little bit more action. Waking up early, another key point. A lot of people, they think, well, I'm just going to wake up right before I have to. But there's a power in the morning. I do most of my work in the morning when it comes to blog writing, when it comes to just thinking free. And I remember early on in my marriage, I have one son, you're beating me right now, you have two more. So if we got in a fight, you probably win. But we are looking at like the beginning of the marriage. And I just love my morning. And I I use it for some time for meditation, awareness. And she was trying to talk to me like that, 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 that. I'm like, stop talking to me. I just want to focus. I just want to (laughs) align my day. And eventually we found a routine that worked for us. But the discipline is something that I didn't want to give up where in the morning, me waking up, me going to the gym, me sorting out my day. Most people just kind of hazardlessly go out in the world and say, okay, let's see what happens. And they wonder why their career is doing this. And they wonder why their life is doing this and the relationship. It's because they just don't have some structure. How do you help people begin to implement structure in their life to become more disciplined? Yeah, well, usually they're the one who are identifying the patterns that they want to break to me in the first place. So in any introduction call, I'll say, you know, what are the areas of focus that you want to work on? And they're going to then divulge all of these areas of weaknesses, the things that they're sick and tired of. Right there, I have what they want to avoid. And pretty much, no matter what they tell me, I will always go back to, great, we're going to wake you up earlier than you want to, we're going to work you whether or not you want to, and we're going to track what you eat, because what goes in is what goes out. And then anytime they struggle with that, two things will happen. One, I'll relate it back to the things that they're sick and tired of happening in their life, because we know that how you do one thing is how you do everything, okay? So if you can't master the basics of when you wake up, what you eat, and how you move your body then of course you're struggling in all the other areas of life. So let's master the fundamentals so that we can be a master at the rest of life, okay? And then the second thing that happens is normally the areas that they're struggling with, there's some sort of behavioral pattern that is emerging that is directly linked to the areas in their life that they're having trouble with. And most of the time, they're completely unaware of it. Obviously, if they were aware of it, they would have the wherewithal to at least try and change, or they would mention it to me if they were aware of it at the beginning. But most of the time they don't, right? And that's why people call them blind spots. If we knew someone was in our blind spot, we wouldn't merge into them, okay? It's an accident. People aren't self-sabotaging because they want to. They're self-sabotaging because they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they're doing wrong. And that's the power of a coach, regardless of the niche. I mean, a coach is somebody who's outside of the picture frame looking in, whereas you're inside the picture frame. You can't get out, turn around and look in. And that's the benefit of it. A lot of things emerge, man. I'll tell you one quick story. There was one of my clients earlier on, started him out real basic, right? He was already waking up at like 6.30. I was like, great, let's just drop down to six. You know what I mean? Like something easy. 
And I gave him a macro based diet based off of what his goals were. And I gave him a workout five days a week is what we started at. Okay. And every week we check in, we'd have our calls. And I saw that his macros in his, in the app that we use were different than what I gave him. So I thought there was a glitch or maybe like I did something wrong because it was early on. So I was learning the software. I was like, man, I must have not programmed it right. It must have changed. And same thing with his workouts. We get on the call and he goes, yeah, you know, I just thought that the carbs were a little high and drop those down and fat. I changed that. And so I realized that on his own accord, he changed both the nutrition and the workout regimen without letting me know. And so I let into him. I have to be honest. I made a post about this the other day. I went full court press on this dude. I was like, you did what? You came to me with one objective to get in shape and to, to help your discipline. And I told you what to eat and what to do in the gym. And you change what you're eating and change what you're doing in the gym. And then on top of that, you're not even doing the things that you changed on because the food you're logging doesn't even match your new made up macros. And I said, what other areas of life have you taken? Have you heeded advice from people who have the results that you want? And then said, ah, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to do something completely different. And he was just like, it was like a deer in the headlights. He was like, man, you're so right. And it's like, I don't want to be right. But hey, you gave me permission to hold you accountable. You have paid me money to help you get a result. And I'm not going to coward out and beat around the bush. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on. And this one's an easy one. You're not doing what I asked you to do. And you don't even see the problem with it. So from now, on, I want you to stick to exactly what I tell you to do. And you're going to have no deviation from it whatsoever. I'm going to hold your ass, your feet to the fire for the next 30 days, right? And what's beautiful about it is, Michael, I wish I had that conversation in my life. I don't know that it ever happened because if it did, I wasn't listening to it, right? But to have a really direct and heartfelt, tough love conversation from somebody who does have your best interests at, at heart, who's from somebody who is completely objective and disconnected from your success, and from somebody who knows better than you in that area, I wish I had that because I could have avoided so many struggles in my life. My learning curve would have been cut in half, if not more. And because I had that conversation with him, which was not comfortable, he is light years ahead of where he would be. I mean, he is an absolute rock star. The last 30 days since his call, he's crushing everything. Like I check in on him. He's like, I got it, boss. And I'm like, yeah, you do. And it was because of that tough love conversation that everything changed. So he needed that. And I would just tell all of your listeners that everyone who's listening to the last two minutes of what I just said, they're thinking of somebody in their head. They have that one person that's just, maybe they're in that toxic relationship or Maybe they're in a job that they absolutely hate or they're just in bad habits or whatever it is. And you want to so badly just tell them what's going on. You have to find the right way to do it. It's got to come from love. You have to get their permission to have these tough love conversations. But how I would start it, and this has helped me a lot to have these conversations is, hey, Michael, you know, I love you, right? You know, anything I say is going to come from a place of love. Okay, cool. I don't want to have this conversation, but I know that if you were in my shoes, you would do this for me. So you're giving that person the benefit of the doubt that they would do this for you, right? So they're like, okay, yeah, because I am a good friend, right? And then you have that conversation. And dude, if they don't change, cool, you can sleep peacefully at night knowing you did everything you could to help them. But if they do, they're going to look back at you, whether it be weeks, months, or years from now and say, man, thank you so much for having that conversation and changed my life. Yeah, it's those conversations that people are afraid to have, I believe, because they believe they're going to lose a friendship if they're a little bit too rough or if they're maybe a bit direct. And as a coach, and when you have clients, sometimes you're going to have to have that tough love. There is many more times that I have tough love for people than I do just sweet and nurturing conversations. And it's like very similar to what you just said, right? I tell them to do something, they don't do it. And I'm just like, what are we doing here? Whether it's relationship, uh, career, it's just like, stop. Let's look at what just happened you just come up with this idea in your head and you think this is the best idea ever. It could be a good idea. Let's look at it. But we have a plan. And the more you deviate from the plan, the longer it's going to get to our destination. Imagine we're going hiking together, California going hiking, right? If I stop at every turn to take a picture of a bush or a cloud or a tree, you know how long it's going to take for us to finish our hike? It's the same aspect when you try to change your plans, change your macros, change what time you wake up. All of that is going to have an effect long term. And we do have to look at what we're trying to do. And we want to get there as quick as possible, as safe as possible. Sometimes you're going to fail. But we do it in a way of, I'm okay doing what I'm doing. Sometimes people, they choose comfort. 
My wife is a perfect example. Similar to the macros, I tell her, okay, well, you want to lose weight, you got to do this. And then all of a sudden she's like, I'm going to do keto. I'm like, what the hell that? We'd even had that conversation. It's just like, whatever. And then eventually not getting the results, right? Okay, well, do what I said. Okay, cool. Results happen. We do have to look at if someone's ahead of us trying to you know, lift us up, why not lean in onto them? And you talked about something great, right? Having those tough conversations. As a young man, my father would lecture us for hours. About an hour and a half, two hours was one of the short lectures. And then sometimes it was three, four hours. And literally, we were just sitting on the sofa. And he's a big guy, you know, like he was in construction. Like literally, his muscles were like bigger than mine, like boulders, like, I, like, like huge, right? And I remember once I went to work with him, I was like a teenager. And I tried to move one of these machines, probably like a ton or something. And he moved it with ease. I, I couldn't even budget. We had a fear for him, even though he didn't lay a hand on us. But the fact that he spent time, spoke with us, gave us those hard disciplines and those hard truths helped me. And I'm sure you're doing that with your boys. You're sitting them down. You're talking to them. Even if they're young, you sit them down. You talk to them. Most people don't have that. When I started Reverend Concepts and I started the coaching, I said, this is going to be something that's going to be long term because many people, if you look at the problems in society, we have an epidemic of single mothers. We have fathers who don't want to be in the household. There are kids growing up who don't have that figure. There's going to be a point where everyone is going to leave high school and they're going to need a coach. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They need to have that hard conversation because life is not going to treat you well and it's going to give you everything that you wish for. You have to go out. You have to grab what you want to grab. When we start to look at society now, right, we can look at clients already and like personal life. But society, what is this epidemic of lack of discipline and maybe even respect? Yeah, I think it's multifaceted. The easy answer is everything is so convenient nowadays that discipline is not in demand. Just think to on like just the most basic evolutionary standpoint, like to attract a mate. Like before you needed to be a warrior, you know, you needed to be all of the things you needed to look the part you needed to be bold, courageous, willing to lay your life down for your tribe, your community, your family, what have you. And now you just have to look decent enough, have all your teeth, be able to drive to and from a date, have enough change to take someone out to dinner and swipe right on an app. You know, it's just completely different to have that, which is such a pivotal not enticement, but incentive in life to elevate oneself, to attract a mate. Whenever that is basically just handed to you, well, what's the intrinsic incentive to, to be better? The same thing with work. Work has just become so automated. You know, we need to sit at a desk. A lot of times we can do things uh, completely remote. You just have to be able to talk, not to take away anything from that. There's a lot of mental effort that goes into it. But nonetheless, I mean, there's just all the incentives have been stripped away because our society is so soft. Right. And I love the saying that says, you know, good men create, well, I'm going to butcher it now, right? Uh, like good men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times, hard times create good men, right? And we're just at a point where we've had such a good time that it's created weak men. And then weak men are weak role models to the next generation. And we're just in this very unfortunate perpetual cycle of disincentive of being disciplined. You know, I don't really know how else to put it. Why would you be disciplined if you don't need to be disciplined anymore? The flip side to that though, is because there's so few people who are willing to do the work, the few that do shine. I mean, just to have an aesthetically pleasing physique nowadays is a huge status symbol because nobody has it. You know, it's like Arnold talks about, you cannot buy your physique. You can't order it. You can't take it, take it off of a shelf. You have to earn it with hours upon hours upon hours of grueling work that no one wants to do, regardless of how much you enjoy lifting weights or running around the block. Everyone doesn't want to do it all of the time. And so you have to earn it through discipline. And that is a status symbol that no one can negotiate with. Now, unless you're Kim Kardashian because uh, Barbie world there, but we have to look at the different sexes to the genders, right? Male and female. Men have to work for what they get, right? Women can, you know, get their uh, BBLs or whatever it's called, like uh, you know, their big butts and their big breasts and stuff like that, right? Very enticing, right? It's, it's an easy process. Men 
we have to build ourselves up from the trenches. And when you're doing it by yourself, it is daunting because you're not going to see your result day one after you go to the gym. You're going to go in the gym day one. All right. I did some biceps. I did some triceps. My arms feel like they're going to fall off. Yep. The next day, you don't want to wake up because you're just so sore. You're just like, I just want to stay in bed and just not feel this anymore. Yes. But you have to push through it. And then so a month happens, two month happens, three month happens. You still might not see the results because your body is breaking itself down, building itself back up. And eventually you're going to get to that physique that you're looking for. But it takes time. It's not a magic pill. Success is just not an overnight phenomenon where it's just like, all right, you just take this and tomorrow you're going to have the perfect body. You're going to have the perfect wife, the perfect house, whatever. Everything's going to be perfect. It's not that. We have to go through the hardship, the challenge, the struggle, the uncertainty, the discipline is going through it and understanding that there's going to be something at the end of it. You might not see over the hill yet, but as soon as you get there, you can finally look back. That's why when I do my fitness stuff with my clients, I say, we're going to take two pictures a month. We're going to take a picture on the first of the month and on the 15th of the month, right? We just split it in half. Now, when you take a picture on the first month, we're going to look at it in three months and the same thing at six months. So we're going to look back in the three months, six months increments. We're not going to look at every single day. And for people who are like, oh, I didn't lose any weight this week or whatever, well, we're building muscle. Okay. I don't want you to make the scale your Bible. All right. Our routine is the Bible. Our discipline is the Bible. And, and when we could do that, then that's when we could start to make some big changes in our life. For the people who are, again, looking for the quick fix, it's not there. How do you help people say, hey, put the boots on, get to work? That's right. And another thing in society, we've overemphasized people's feelings so much too. And what I've learned is that if you want to get really good at being disciplined, you have to disregard your feelings. You have to become almost robotic. You have to put all the emphasis on your systems, not how you feel about the systems. Our feelings will tell us, don't wake up. Our feelings will tell us, eat that, not this. Our feelings will tell us, don't get into the gym. But you have to have this pre-decision made. What I've learned is that the decisions are really where people get tripped up. If you have not made a commitment to what you're doing, what you're eating and all that stuff, then you fumble with rationalizing these decisions or justifying these decisions. You have to have the decision made before the time the decision comes to you. For example, if you're eating a certain diet and it needs to be protein heavy rather than carb heavy, and you have a choice between pasta or a steak, you don't then think about the decision right there. It's already made, right? You don't, you just skip across the pasta and go, where's the st steak? That's what I want. Because the decision has already been made and you disregard any emotion that might pop up at that time because you've already dealt with the emotion when you made the decision. Bob Proctor talks about pre-decisions. That eliminates so many opportunities for people to get tripped up because you don't have to struggle with it every single day. You struggle with it one time, you make a commitment to it, and then you just simply do it absent of the emotion. But again, society says, be in your feelings. Like, are you offended by that? Like that has no place in discipline. I offend myself all the time, you know? <laughs> and as a result of that, I'm able to accomplish things that other people aren't because I don't worry about it. No, my mind plays tricks on me. What's your take on emotional intelligence? I don't know if you saw any of my episodes on it, but if you did, you know my take, but I want to know your take on it. No, I didn't. I'm glad I did not. So I can give you my take. Absolutely. What you know. So whenever I think about emotional intelligence, let me know if I'm going in the right direction. So I think of EQ versus IQ, emotional intelligence being, you know, being able to read somebody's emotional cues or their facial expressions, being able to know how to approach somebody to mirror energy with somebody to build rapport with somebody and trust. Is that what emotional intelligence you're talking about? Well, emotional intelligence has many different meanings. There's about five aspects to emotional intelligence. The aspect of emotional intelligence that society speaks of is being openly emotional, being in touch with your feelings, being able to express your feelings, being able to control your feelings, basically all of that in a nutshell. So what happened with emotional intelligence is that they told men, oh, be more emotional. You know, like if you have to cry, cry. If you have to take a rest day, take a rest day, right? Go easy on yourself emotional intelligence, that is where society is going is, and it's not conducive for making and building strong men. 
I did a whole episode on it, but like, but again, I want to have a conversation with you on emotional intelligence there. I love where we're going with that. Uh, maybe I have an interesting take on this. I am big in both aspects of that. I do believe that men should cry. I believe that all of us have traumas that we have endured throughout our life that create these unconscious behavioral patterns that oftentimes self-sabotage us. And we don't know that they're happening and they happen from events that most of the time we completely forgot about because normally in traumatic events, your mind suppresses that memory because the memory harms us. I believe it's very important for men to be able to exercise their emotions. However, I think it's very important that it's done in a compartmentalized fashion. For me, I hired a life coach three years ago, and she, for the longest time, has been doing these women's retreats that are four day long, uh, immersive retreats in the mountains. And my mother has been on a few, my sister went on some, my wife has been on two, and everyone just raves. And I'm like, well, yo, when are you going to do one for men, right? And so she started a men's only retreat, and I've gone to now three of them. So for four days, you go out to the mountains, you still have your cell phone, but I mean, it's like up in your room, you're very disconnected, you cannot hide, it's a maximum of eight men, and she goes deep into the most uncomfortable topics of your life. And she'll say at the beginning, my intention is to make you cry, okay? And like, that's gonna happen. I, before that, like, had I cried, yes, but was I emotional? Absolutely not. It would always get up to here. And then it was like, I just didn't know how to release my emotions. It, like you would have to coach me to like, relax my jaw, breathe heavily, relax my eyes and like coach me to cry because something was blocking me. And it was because there was traumas that happened as a child from a father who was had a very short temper, very loud whenever he lost his temper. And as a five-year-old, six-year-old child, being screamed at, you know, 10 out of 10 rage, that does stuff to you, creates these like survival mechanisms that you carry on into adulthood, you don't know about, but you're reacting to something based off a of previous experience. Well, how I was reacting to certain things caused me to be avoidant to confrontational uh, conversations, like the tough love conversation that we started the podcast with. That would make me very uncomfortable before I did my work for reasons that I didn't know why until I did the work and realized, well, as a five-year-old child, if you have this powerful figure over you like this, well, your reaction is to go like this. And if you never know that that's a problem, because that's the only experience you had in your life and you never know to go, hey, you're no longer a five-year-old boy. That fear is literally a memory. It's a figment of your imagination now, like that's in the past. That's not happening in the real world. You can pick yourself up, you're okay, right? Your functional adult is here and he can protect that wounded child of yours. And like, you're going to be all right. And before I was able to have that explained to me and have that processed out and go through the process of forgiving my father for what he did, because he was learning back then too, I would have been so limited in my ability to function as an adult. Now, the short answer to that is I think it's so incredibly important for men to be in their feelings, but it has to be compartmentalized. And then once you get back into the real world, that shit's behind you. Now you got to execute because the only thing that we're really judged on is, is our accomplishments. Like what do we act, what results do we actually bring? So once you got that flushed out, now avoid those emotions, stick to your system, stick to your disciplines. You got to provide, you got to protect, you got to preside over your family and you got to bring the food to the table. And then if things build up again, you might need to go back to the mountains. You might need to seek a coach. You might need to say, okay, doors closed. Look, man, pressure's way too tough. I need some help. You might need to cry it out a little bit but it's got to be compartmentalized. It has to be strategic. If you are guided by your emotions, you're a ship without a rudder. But if you can do it strategically, I think that you uh, take off the lid to your potential because there's a lid on you if you don't do that stuff that you don't know is there. And all you're going to do is just frustrate yourself whenever you can't break through these levels because you don't know why you're doing certain things, right? And you said the key at the end, right? We should not be guided by our emotions. We should have control of our emotions. We should understand we are human. We have emotions. I have no problem with men want to cry. Again, there's a right place and a right time for it. If you're in the gym crying because you have to run another mile, all right, keep on crying while you're running because we ain't stopping. That's right. The reason I asked that question is because you said we're more in our feelings now. And you are very true, right? People are more in their feelings. Comfort is a feeling, right? People want to feel comfortable. They don't want to feel stressed. They don't want to feel anxious or afraid. So they're going to do things on the lowest level 
because that's the safest level. So level one is the easiest level. Think of a video game, right? Mario, whatever. You can beat level one again and again and again. But the moment you get to level 53 or something like that, and you're like, this is hard. What do you do? Do you persevere? Or do you go back to level one where you can know you have a sense of succeeding, a sense of glory? Most people, they don't want to go through the hardship of level 53. They want to stay at level one. How do we help people level up, get out of that mindset of like 53 is okay. I was going to interrupt you because you were saying that people want to feel comfortable. Therefore, they do the, the least amount of, of effort, right? And to me, genuinely, whenever I do the least is whenever I feel the most uncomfortable. If I have an unproductive day, I am so stressed about the fact that I did not produce at the highest level. I am very uncomfortable with that. Vice, the, the, or the flip side of that is I'm waking up on time. I crush my workout. I crush my nutrition. I crush work. I'm crushing it with my kids. We're having a great time doing fun stuff. I got, I'm flirting with my wife, you know, like everything's going great. At the end of the day, I put in max effort. I sleep more comfortably then, right? I am so comfortable with my day because I know that I gave it a 10 out of 10. I feel good. I would feel the opposite if I did not do that, right? I mean, you're hitting on all the right points here because we do have to look at by the end of the day, we should feel exhausted, but we should feel proud of what we just did. I understand that life can be hard. I can understand you could be in some work right now that you don't like, but you can give yourself a plan. You can give yourself some direction to change, but it does begin with you making a choice. I have a saying, and I said this probably like 2021 when I did my first series or my first season of motivation and motion. Motivation is motivation, right? Discipline is discipline. You need discipline versus motivation, right? Motivation is temporary. But the first line I say in motivation and motion, episode one, season one, there are two types of people in this world, people who want it and people who kind of want it. And the people who kind of want it are always going to choose the path of conformity, choose the path of, path of complacency. They're going to choose to have no discipline and they're going to blame everyone else for their own faults, for their lack of success, fulfillment, happiness, joy, whatever it is. And as long as those people have that notion of they just kind of want it, then they're going to live a life that's going to be un, like unfulfilled and full of regret. I like to tell people, live life without regret. Challenge yourself today. Do not leave anything left in the tank. I understand you can, but don't, right? We're not looking at tomorrow as, oh, we need to save some energy for tomorrow. We'll get energy. Trust me, the body and the brain, they do amazing things. If you have to show up, the brain is going to say, hey, we got to show up. We don't have a choice. Yep. And our conversation today was literally just helping people, guide people into a mindset of saying that you have a choice for the better or for the worse. You can go on that roller coaster of life, the ups and downs, experiencing all of the things that you may or may not want to feel, but you do have to dive into the uncomfortable. So one day you can relish in this fact that you did something hard so you can have a better life in the future. Sacrifice today. So you can live like a king later on. There's a mindset there. But as we begin to wrap up, I would love to have some final words from you. And then to please tell the audience where they can find you. Yeah. Thanks again for having me on. I was thinking about something that Earl Nightingale said, and it's that the opposite of courage is not cowardice. It's conformity. And I love that so much because everyone dreams of being courageous right? And they think the opposite of that is just not being courageous, being a coward. And it's not even the truth at all. The opposite of courage is a conformist, which so many people are. Part of it is human nature. We want to fit into the, to the herd, to the crowd, right? To our community. Because back in the day, being ostracized meant you were out on your own and you could actually literally get killed, get eaten by a predator. But nowadays, that's not the case. And if you look at anyone who's made an impact in the world, they've all been renegades. They've been mavericks. They've been people who have bucked the system. They've been people who are not conformist and they did things their own way. And it doesn't have to be something that gives you all the attention. It could be something as simple as you just work out every day, whether you feel like it or not. And the results of that will make you that way because no one else is doing it. Just be the one person who, whenever they're offered a drink, just say, hey, no, thanks, not tonight. That's it. Like you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to explain yourself to say, no, thanks, not tonight. Cool. Right. You do that enough. The compound effect of saying, no, thanks, not tonight will 
unbelievable results for you. So I would just urge everybody to be courageous, to observe the masses and investigate the opposite, because oftentimes the opposite is the best way to go. Be comfortable in your own skin, even if it's uncomfortable at the beginning, okay? And own your power. All you have to do is start. The hardest part about this whole journey is the anticipation of the start. It's like jumping off of a high dive. You're up there and you're scared, right? But as soon as you jump, you're like, all right, let's go. And then before, it, before you know it, you're in the water and you're at the side of the pool and you're like, let's do it again. Skip the anticipation, get your butt out of bed. As soon as your two feet land on the floor, you're fine. As soon as you walk into the gym, you're glad you're there. As soon as you finish the meal that you know you should have had, you're proud of yourself for doing it. Do the things you know you need to do and live without regret, like you said, because there's two pains, like I'm sure you've mentioned in many of your episodes, the pain of discipline and the pain of regret. And discipline weighs pounds and regret weighs tons and you never get rid of it. Yeah, I just hope that urges people just to take the first step. You hear it from the greats and you hear it from everyday people. Just start and you'll be glad you did. The place that I'm most active on is Instagram. My handle is Justin underscore Peterson, the number one. And then I'm also on Facebook as well at Justin Peterson. I'll give my phone number out to anybody who wants to text me directly uh, if you're interested in working together. My number is 919-480-3830. Shoot me a text and I'm happy to chat with anybody. And Michael, man, if there's anything I can do for you too, please let me know. I love the energy you bring to this show. I love the contributions you've made this. I do just like you. I do plenty of podcasts and some are fun and some are not so fun. And you clearly know what you're doing. You clearly are a, a very, very articulate and competent coach. And I know that everyone who works with you has to absolutely see results. So thanks for what you do for the world. And thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate that. And I'm so glad that you were able to make some time, come speak with the audience and to share about your story, your life, your journey, and your work as a coach, because it is important that people realize that there's going to be different cups of tea that they can try. I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea. That's why I have coaching in session. There's so many coaches that come on. They can say, this is my flair. Does it resonate with you? And you find someone that resonates and you just go with them. You trust them because that's what you have to have when you're you know, being coached. You have to trust that coach because if you don't trust them, you're going to start to do what we said in the beginning. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do that. Where's the trust? The moment you can find someone that you can trust, and I think Justin is going to be an example of who you can trust. All his links are going to be in the description box below so you can easily find them. Reach out to him on Instagram, Facebook, and maybe give him a call or a text. Now, understand there are business hours so don't go too crazy but i'm sure he's going to be so happy to hear from you and he's going to be happy to help you on the next mission in your life and that's going to be to become more disciplined and to find true glory all right everyone i'd like to thank you so much for watching that episode with justin peterson and myself what went on is we were talking about discipline we talked about all different aspects we even threw in something i almost despise if we think of it in the wrong manner emotional intelligence Justin spoke of it about EQ, which I do like. I think that you can be emotionally aware of what people are feeling, uh, living, right? Sympathy, empathy. I think that's an important aspect to any coach, client relationship, or maybe even any relationship in general, friend, marriage, spouse, partner, whatever. That right there is important. We do have to understand that. But I'm always talking about when it comes to emotional intelligence, it's like you're not going to cry down the moment someone says no to you. Go back to the office and say, well, why did they say no? What happened? Did I do something wrong? Can I learn from this? I was watching a video the other day. I believe his name is Justin Wallace. I know his name is Justin. I forget the last name, but it's sort of a W. He owns a steel company, of course, some real estate stuff. But he was talking about an aspect of how he has someone go into the hateful comments, take a picture of them, and send it to him and his YouTube manager. And so what he would do is he reflects on it. That helps him be grounded because sometimes you could be in a really good place. I'm in a really good place. And you just don't see your blind spots. As we said, as Justin said, you're right. You just don't see your blind spots. When you have someone giving you hate, maybe giving constructive criticism, do you pay attention or do you think you know it all? Now, when it comes to discipline, you can Begin the process of discipline, getting a coach, getting a mentor, getting some help. That's going to be the first step. 
But the second step is going to be constantly learning. We are always evolving. Who you are as a person has changed. Look back five years, 10 years, 20 years if you're that old. You'll see that you have changed, that you are different. Look at a picture. Oh, look, I was so fat, or look, I was so skinny, or look, I was so in shape. What happened? You changed. What was that change in those five years? Was there a level of discipline there? Was there a level of ego there? Was there a level of a purpose? Maybe something happened on the negative side. Was there a trauma there? Was there a moment of grief? What happened? Many people don't look at what happens in their life. They just accept what happens. It's almost like what I say quite often is people accept the scraps that are thrown at them. And that's what the world gives you, scraps, whatever's left over. Your 9 to 5 is a scrap. You can go after so much more than a 9 to 5. And I'm not saying that you can't be fulfilled in a 9 to 5. You might love your work. But there's an aspect to finding who you truly are, what you can accomplish to true human potential. The only way to get there is with discipline. If you think that you can get there without discipline, you are going to find that it's going to be an uphill battle and you're not going to win. You can't just say, well, I feel like doing it today, and then you don't do it tomorrow. And then I feel like doing it today, but I'm not going to do it next week because it was a lot of work. There's an aspect that discipline creates, and that is success. You can be successful to some degree without discipline, but the more you become undisciplined, the more areas in life are going to become tainted. So if you don't have discipline for eating, right, you're going to get fat. You're going to be unhealthy. Maybe you have other problems come up. You still might be successful, but you start to see that health is a big part. And most people don't fall off that horse until they finally get a doctor's note and, you know, like a heart attack or whatever, and it wakes them up. I can't tell you how many clients I have who had strokes, heart attacks, a bad doctor's note, bouts with cancer, and it wakes them up. And it's almost like, why do you wait to wake up? Why do you wait to take action? It's the lack of discipline. It's the lack of accountability. It's the feeling that you want to be comfortable. You have to challenge that notion every single day, every single moment. Many people are not going to do it. Many people are going to wish they had good things. They're going to wait for Superman to come save them. They're going to hope that things happen in their favor, win the lotto. You can take action. You can win. And I mean, every morning, you win the lotto. You get to wake up. There are people who don't wake up. There are people who think they're going to have a nice day tomorrow. They go to sleep and that's it for them. But yet when you wake up, you hit the snooze button. You hate going into work. You are slow to get ready. You're not hungry enough. Les Brown said, you got to be hungry. You got to be hungry. And in a sense, you do have to be hungry. You want to eat scraps, leftovers, for the rest of your life? Or do you want that nice juicy steak? Do you want a nice meal? That can be discipline. That is what discipline brings. So if you're struggling with discipline, if you're struggling with reaching new heights in your life, reach out to Justin or myself. We specialize in helping people become more disciplined. The process and the systems that we have worked with other clients with is just a tried and true method. It just works. Because we can see where you're lacking because it's a blind spot most likely because you've been doing it so long. So stop living life with those blind spots. Stop living life in the slow lane. Do not think that you have tomorrow. Take action today. My name is Michael Reardon. and I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me coachinginsession at gmail.com and I'll see everyone on the next episode of Coaching In Session. Until then, everyone take care.